Hi, it's Dwyer, GamblersAdvisory.com, DwyerVIP.com, on Roku, Dwyer Boxing, and Sports News. Remember, the opinion you should follow should be your own. Just consider this video to be a second opinion from a complete stranger online. Let's talk boxing. <clears throat> it's a Monday morning. Um, just a couple of things on my plate. First, let's talk about Floyd Mayweather, 48 and 0. Right, Floyd, in interviews, says 48 men have tried, 48 men have failed, right? We know the number is a little bit less than 48 because there's some rematches in there. But Floyd has a great point in saying, hey, I'm 48 and 0. And, of course, he's hoping to retire at 49 and 0 or 50 and 0. But you know the way I feel about boxing, right? I'm biased. I'm totally unfair. There's no rational thought behind this personal belief, but in my eyes, there's the heavyweight championship, <clears throat> and then there's everything else, right? When I think back to the 1970s, an era with some great champions, right, in numerous weight classes, I literally defined that era by just a few fighters, right? George Foreman, Ali, Joe Fraser. Folks, that takes you to something like 1976. Then you have Larry Holmes, Ken Norton, right? You remember the heavyweights in the 1980s. Who defines that era, quite frankly, more than Mike Tyson? Now, you had great champs, Marvin Hagler, Ray Leonard, right? Spectacular champions. But you always remember the heavyweight champion, 1990s. Lennox Lewis, right? Lewis is so blinding, it's hard to remember. There's some other great champs then. Yes, I know Roy Jones ruled the roost. But understand, the heavyweight champion, by definition, has gravitas. We're now, quite frankly, in the Klitschko era. Pick your Klitschko. Vitaly, Vladimir, right? Whatever else is happening in boxing, you remember the big name. Right, Even the Ray Robinson era, I'm telling you, I had the benefit of my father until I was well into adulthood, and he remembers that era as the Joe Lewis era. Right, Not the Ray Robinson era, the Joe Lewis era. Right, So, let me say this. Floyd Mayweather's 48-0. You know, the number 49 has a certain magic for those of us who live and die by the heavyweight division. That was Marciano's number, 49 and 0. Then he walks away, right? Larry Holmes had the same record as Floyd Mayweather does today, 48 and 0. And then he lost. Right? So people are caught up, if you're a heavyweight observer, with the numbers 49 and 48. Why is Floyd Mayweather bandying around those numbers? Let's just get real. Why is he picking numbers from the heavyweight division? Because outside the heavyweight division, the criteria changes, doesn't it? Right? Let me just tell you, too, why are we fixated? on the beginning of a fighter's career. Some great fighters, Marquez, Bernard Hopkins, lost very early in their careers. Isn't the true measure of greatness the streaks guys put together in their primes? Let me just say this. Forget the number 48, right? That's impressive. Until you realize that Julio Cesar Chavez had an 87 fight winning streak. 87. Sugar Ray Robinson, aren't these the ghosts in Floyd's neighborhood? Sugar Ray Robinson had an unbeaten streak of 91 fights. 91. Right? So let's not get too carried away with Floyd's 48. I'll agree. Floyd is perhaps the best fighter I've seen. He's tremendous. Right? He's tremendous. He certainly belongs in the short list of fighters I've seen. 
I don't feel he had a period of dominance like I saw Roy Jones have in the 1990s where the guy's not only winning but the guy is stopping opponents in overwhelming fashion. I would say the most dominant fighter I've seen at any period of time, the guy who was most like Secretariat, where if everyone was on a track, this guy lapped the field by a wide margin, is probably the Roy Jones who destroys Virgil Hill. Right? Jones truly was dominant. Now, Mayweather's dominance is a bit different. Right? Lately, guys have been going the distance with him. His dominance isn't completely offensive. He's a defensive wizard. Right? You don't see the great fighters hitting the canvas like Virgil Hill hit the canvas against Roy Jones. Rather, you see them just completely outclassed and then having to make excuses after the fight about some messed up shoulder that was undisclosed. Right? Like Manny Pacquiao has been humiliated into doing following a real disappointing performance against Floyd Mayweather. Make no mistake, Mayweather's a great fighter. But please understand, the conversation about 48 wins and 49 wins, that's a conversation that belongs in the heavyweight division. Right? Not the welterweight division. If we're going to get outside of the heavyweight division, then really the conversation should be on different metrics because different metrics exist outside of the heavyweight division, don't they? Now let's, let's get back to Mayweather briefly. Understand that Larry Holmes, when he was 48 and 0, and by the way, how many of you Remember the fact that Larry was 48 and 0. When we talk about the best heavyweights in history, is Larry Holmes on the tip of your top? Because understand that's the risk involved for Floyd Mayweather in fight number 49. Right? If he loses it, the boxing public is a very hard public. We're very unforgiving. No one remembers that Holmes beat Ken Norton, beat Ali, beat an unbeaten Jerry Cooney. No one remembers it. When you talk about champs, people always default to Ali, Joe Lewis, Lennox Lewis. They don't refer to Larry Holmes. They just don't. Now, many of you are skeptics on Floyd Mayweather, right? Because you want to see the kind of dominance that you saw with Roy Jones, right? Roy Jones, by the way, once went around against an offensive fighter, Vinny Paz, right? Paz wasn't shy about throwing punches. And did you know, according to CompuBox, over that three-minute round, Pazienza landed no punches, right? That's how dominant... Roy Jones was. Let me also say as an aside to Roy, online there are photos of Roy posing with Marco Huck. The two guys are looking tough, you know, boxing, it's a cheesecake photo. The two guys are looking tough and facing each other. Fortunately, they're not scheduled to fight each other. If they do, they might not need a doctor at that fight. They might need a coroner. Because Marco Huck would, in my opinion, almost certainly take out Roy Jones. Roy's only chance to me would be to try to land a left hook early in the fight. If he doesn't get off a left hook early in that fight, Marco Huck would almost certainly knock out Roy Jones, who's a shell of himself today. But understand, Roy, in his prime, was secretariat. I don't believe people consider Mayweather to be secretariat. Right? They consider Mayweather to be a craftsman, not a guy who just dominates an opponent, lays them out. Right, The Virgil Hill fight, for those who remember, ends on a Roy Jones body shot. That's how lethal Roy Jones was at the time. He was knocking guys out on body shots. Right, So, Mayweather has to be careful in picking his opponent. Let me tell you the mistake Larry Holmes made. 
Now, this is before the cruiserweight division. Larry decides to pick on, believe it or not, the light heavyweight champion. Right? This would be like Vladimir Klitschko trying to get a record, trying to tie Rocky Marciano. And so he picks, as an opponent, Sergei Kovalev, the champ at 175 pounds. Now, the fight's controversial. I'm not sure if Holmes lost that fight. Forget what the judges said. Look at your own eyes. Right? The fight's controversial. But understand, Holmes went for a lighter touch, weight-wise. Right? Went for an unbeaten light heavyweight champion. And lost. More than the fight. If you're scratching your head wondering why I'm mentioning Larry Holmes here, he lost a lot of legacy with that loss. Understand, had he won, we'd be saying Marciano and Holmes 49-0. and Now Floyd is talking about fighting Andre Berto or Karim Mayfield. Let's hope that he's working on a stand-up comedy routine. Were you clamoring for either of these guys to get a shot at the title at 147 pounds before Floyd mentioned them? You know, Andre Berto, in my opinion, and this is just my opinion, lacks confidence against right-handed fighters. There has to be a reason why when you look at the Berto resume, there's so many southpaws on the resume. More importantly, how many fights are you going to see Berto in where he gets hit an inordinate amount of times? The Luis Colazzo fight. Isn't Berto battered in that fight? The Victor Ortiz fight. Isn't Berto battered in that fight? By battered, I mean hit several times. The Robert the Ghost Guerrero fight. Isn't Berto battered in that fight? What is it about Andre Berto that moves him to the head of the line? Right? You know, if I'm Floyd, I would be very careful here. Understand, even Larry Holmes had more cover than this, because Larry Holmes fought an unbeaten fighter. Here, Floyd would be fighting a guy who's been beaten, and quite frankly, in recent fights, the Josecito Lopez fight, found himself in a shootout. Right? Let me say this, too. There's certain guys calling out Floyd that the press, of course, is down on because the only group possibly more deluded than us boxing fans is the boxing media, right? Let's just say the boxing media at times misses the boat. Anthony Mundine has called out Floyd Mayweather. You know, when we think about Shane Mosley's career, and Mosley is coming back, right? Only one man has stopped him. One. That's Anthony Mundane. Right? One guy. If you look closely at Mundine's record, you're going to see that Mundine really is a boxing Hall of Famer. Right? Now, I'll agree Mundine has had some bad nights. The Garth Wood night, that's a terrible night. The Clotty uh, night, that's a terrible night. Let me say, too, Clotty belongs in the conversation of who should fight Floyd in his last fight. But let's just say this. Mundine is physically bigger than Floyd Mayweather. Mundine fights a very similar style to Mayweather. Both guys are defensive fighters. Why are people dismissing the idea of a Floyd-Anthony Mundine fight? Does anyone watching this video really believe that Andre Berto would beat Anthony Mundine? I don't. That Andre Berto has more box office appeal than Anthony Mundine? I don't. Right? So, just food for thought. I hope Floyd expands the net of people he has to fight. Let me say this, too. The fifth round of Colasso against Keith Thurman is disturbing. Right? Keith Thurman, when he's moving, excellent fighter. If you can lull him into the pocket, you're going to notice that he's not as good. Colazzo is able to hit him with a great body shot after 
Thurman overextends himself. Thurman looks shaky in the pocket, just like he did in the pocket against Julio Diaz. Now, I'll agree, fighting Keith Thurman carries big risks because Thurman has a big punch. But if you're Floyd Mayweather and you're looking for a young lion in his prime, who might have problems against boxing brilliance in the pocket, wouldn't Thurman be a candidate? Let me say this, too. For all of his flaws, and yes, I thought he lost his last fight. For all of his flaws, I still believe Amir Khan gives Floyd Mayweather all he can handle. Right? Khan has hand speed. Can we agree? Khan has a jab. Can we agree? Even though the guys are roughly the same height, Khan knows how to use length. And Khan's legs are such that he could fight a Luis Colazzo. Just compare and contrast Khan Colazzo with Thurman Colazzo. Right? Khan could fight a Luis Colazzo and completely dominate him. Now, Khan's been pleading for a fight. Count me among those who believe style wise, Khan gives Mayweather all he can handle. Right? Again, Khan's had some bad nights. The Danny Garcia night, okay, fair enough. But styles make fights. Khan's style is a difficult style for Floyd Mayweather. No one's saying Khan's had the better career than Mayweather. All I'm saying is Khan is a tough matchup because of the hand speed, the volume, the length, the uh, use, the foot speed, the fact that he uses height. All of that would be problematical. Now, speaking of problems, guys who have had rough nights, let's talk about heavyweight David Price. Now, let me say this. You know, heavyweights age more slowly than everyone else. Just look at Vladimir Klitschko's age. Look at his brother Vitaly's age when he ruled the roost. Think about some of the older champions in boxing, right? George Foreman, Evander Holofield, if you want to include Evander's secondary titles, right? I'm telling you that unlike, let's say, bantamweight, where you're, you know, either a star in your 20s or you're not going to be a star, in heavyweight, you have a lot of guys older in life, Sonny Liston, right, who blossom later in their careers, right? Amir Manzur, right now, is a threat, and I believe he's in his 40s. So David Price is about 32 years old, right? David Price still has time. Let's remember, too, fighters can change parts of their game. It's hard to imagine a heavyweight looking worse than Vladimir Klitschko looked against Corey Sanders. He looked terrible. Like Price, he got KO'd early. He retooled his game. He changed a few things, changed trainers, changed his approach. Uh, keep in mind, this is at a time where even his brother told him he, need to, he needed to get out of the sport. And the last time I checked, Vladimir Klitschko has something like a 10 or 11 year winning streak. Right? If you're facing the bar and some man walks in the bar and the bartender says, there's the heavyweight champion of the world without turning around, you're going to know he's talking about Vladimir Klitschko. Not anyone else with some version of the belt. Now, David Price, I'll say this, he's an athlete. He's taller than you think. Understand Tepper, the guy who beat him is 6'5". Price towers over him. Price is coordinated to the point where you don't realize that he's an NBA power forward in terms of size. Right? Now what he's going to have to do, because he did get destroyed, in my favorites folder here, I actually have a copy of his most recent fight. What he's going to have to do is he's going to have to retool his game. Since he's in his 30s, he won't be able to move around the ring like 
young Ali or like young Andre Durrell. Because the legs are the first to go. Understand, Ali himself wasn't moving around the ring in his 30s. Right? Rather, Price is going to have to figure out ways to improve his game close to the pocket. Right? Let me offer a few suggestions. You saw the Mayweather-Ricky Hatton fight. The beginning of the end for Ricky Hatton is when he gets hit with what Mayweather called a check left hook. Right? David Price, whose jab isn't that good. Right? You heard me mention Larry Holmes. David Price's jab is not going to be mentioned in the same sentence, paragraph, page as Larry Holmes's jab. And I don't believe guys can just magically come up with a great jab. So David Price is going to have to develop punches that can help him with the pacing of a fight and keep an aggressive opponent like Tepper off of him. He needs to come up with some good short punch that an opponent has to respect on the way in, has to cover up for. He needs to develop, in my opinion, his own version of a check left hook. If the guy comes in covering up that side of his body, he needs to have a plan B. Short uppercut, short right hand to the body, short something. The point, though, is it has to be short because right now he's too long. If you get inside on him, he just crumbles. He actually does clinch Tepper a couple of times in that first round. Look at it. He does tie him up. A couple of times but still Tepper keeps coming and he has nothing else to keep Tepper off of him so he needs to develop a couple of short punches to do that a left hook since he's a righty would be a good idea because it's up front right developing an uppercut look at the Scott Quick Scott Quick has some of the same problems folks look at the Scott Quick Kiko Martinez tape that uppercut can cause a lot of problems to a guy coming in. Understand the most troubling part of the film is the fact that Tepper is 6'5". And he's able to get underneath David Price. What about heavyweights who are 6 feet, 6'1", six 6'2"? Six They're going to give Price a lot of trouble. A lot of trouble. Right? Let me say this too. His matchmaker really has done a bad job, whoever it is. Tony Thompson, who beat Price twice, was a difficult matchup. You knew that because Tony Thompson has a jab and he's a southpaw. Right? You look at some Tony Thompson fights and inexperienced right-handed fighters have a hard time finding Tony in the ring. Look at Tony's KO percentage, too, especially when he was younger. Tony sits down on punches. You understood that if Price had an off night and Tony Thompson had a good night, that fight could have ended by stoppage. Both fights did. Now, I know David Price beat a southpaw in Audley Harrison, but Audley Harrison isn't in the area code of Tony Thompson. Somebody in his corner convinced him to take on a difficult southpaw too soon. That was bad matchmaking. Now here, this really wasn't a voluntary fight for David Price, right? Because he was fighting for the EBU championship, so he had to fight Tepper. Okay, fair enough. But this was a bad matchup too because this guy's on his front foot throwing Kenny Norton type wide punches, wide power punches. What David Price has to do is he has to fool us, the boxing fan. His matchmaker should do this. This is common in boxing, by the way. This is how you build up a prospect. His matchmaker needs to be wise enough to realize that David Price has a problem against guys who can operate on their front foot. He needs to fight guys who are more back foot heavy. 
right? Look up a Malik Scott. You want to fight guys like that. That'll give David Price an opportunity to not get crowded. You don't want him fighting guys who can fight inside, who want to fight inside. Look at the end of this fight. Look where David Price falls on the canvas. He's well over by the side of the ring by the corner. You want David Price in the middle of the ring, not against a guy who's going to force him over by the ropes. Right? And so, I'll say this too. Many people are saying Price should hang it up. Look at the heavyweight division closely. I'm not a believer in Deontay Wilder. Deontay Wilder doesn't like to fight inside. I think David Price would have been more competitive against Deontay Wilder than he was against Tepper based on styles. If you have champions out there who are a bit shaky, and if you're an athlete, Price is maybe not one of the better fighters at heavyweight, but he's certainly one of the best athletes at heavyweight. Price is an athlete. Price has size. Right? If I'm David Price, I don't quit here. I actually regroup. Right? I look at Vladimir Klitschko, the changes he made, how he rejuvenated his career, how he stopped going from being a fighter leaning over his front foot to being a guy who used length. And I try to emulate that. Right? So I'll say this. Did Price look terrible? Absolutely. The guy gets inside on him. Price has no answers. Right? Um, the disturbing thing was with the knockdown is... Price is getting clubbed in the first round. <laughs> Even the knockdown, the guy is clubbing him, and it's really in the middle of a combination that Price gets hit with a left hook and goes down. Right? Price looked bad. I would argue, though, that he's too good an athlete to call it a career at this point, especially since I personally believe Vladimir Klitschko might lose his next fight, and then the heavyweight division might be open. But make no mistake, if I'm David Price, there is no way I get close to a ring with a skilled southpaw like a Tony Thompson. If Tyson Fury does beat Vladimir Klitschko, David Price needs to stay away from Tyson Fury, at least for the next two or three years while he develops his skills. If there's a fighter, you, hear, you heard me mention Amir Manzer earlier. If there's a fighter with skills on the inside, if I'm David Price's people, I stay away from that fighter. Right? Don't have elimination matches where you're the one who's likely to get eliminated. You're better off building up your resume. Price is going to have to take the long road. He's going to have to stay away from the sport. Uh, put it this way, stay away from certain types of fighters for the next two years while he rebuilds his confidence. My point is simply this. We're at an odd moment in the heavyweight division. Everyone's getting excited over guys who have little more than three rounds of experience in fights. Anthony Joshua. right? People are excited by... Deontay Wilder, a guy who almost gets decked by Eric Molina in his last fight. And of course, who of you, before that last fight, considered Eric Molina to be an elite fighter? Understand how shaky the heavyweight division is. Chris Ariola was lucky to get the draw in his last fight. Right? Guys like Rishlan Chigaev are still active. Right? One would have thought the Fred's Akendo fight would have eliminated Chigai if he's still active. Right? And so my point is this. The heavyweight division right now is in too much turmoil for an athlete like David Price to walk away from the sport here. Right? He's 32. He still has some years ahead of him. He still has a punch. He just needs to fight back foot guys Guys with negative energy, not positive energy. And he just needs to develop something. Some short series of punches. 
so that a guy who's hyper aggressive comes in and then as he's coming in has to think check left hook your uppercut you know right to the body you know then realizes hey I can't bum rush David Price anyway that's how I see it let me hear from you leave your comments for me here online visit us at gamblersadvisory.com thanks for stopping by